Memorial Day, my fellow Americans, and happy Monday to everybody out there. I'm Scott Fontana. Follow me on Twitter at Scott underscore Fontana. And I'm Dan Urban. Follow me at the Dan Urban. Follow the podcast at Couchside Judges and subscribe to us on YouTube and everywhere else that you listen. And that podcast is the Couchside Judges, which I forgot to mention. I should probably put that in there, right? Yeah. And as always, we talk judging in MMA, so make sure you read the scoring criteria. We, we talk about judging on the Couchside Judges? That's what we do. Yeah. Every week? Every week. No shit. Usually. Wow. Every We're week. still waiting for that perfect card. We are waiting for that card. Um, we were close once or twice. Mm-hmm. And then all those terrible judges dropped the ball. Mm-hmm. No. no, no, no. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's an off week for us. We don't actually have live fights to discuss. Not that there weren't live fights in the world, but uh, none, none that we felt the need to kind of keep up with this time. We gave ourselves a little, a little bit of break, you know? Yeah, there's no fights that I'm even aware of. I I mean, there's always fights. There's always fights. It's just, not, not I, if I'm not aware not, of it, there isn't. <laughs> I guess you could stick your head in the sand, and then, yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, Dan, it's, uh, this is uh, a holiday edition of the Couchside Judges. Yes. In the sense that uh, it's coming out on a holiday. Mm-hmm. On a holiday weekend. What do you, what's, <laughs> what is your, what's your Memorial Day plans? Uh, burgers. Burgers. Okay. Just looking at burgers or burgers. burgers. A hot dog. I mean, I won't. I won't. You making the burgers? What are you doing? Eating them. All right. That's what I'm doing. Who makes them? I don't know. I don't really care either. <laughs> Just, I'm, but I'm gonna be eating them. All right. Dogs? Uh, oh yeah. All right. Maybe potato salad. Ew. No. Macaroni salad. No. No. You're not even American. Uh, honestly, what? That's that's like mayonnaise, right? Not all of it. Ha- not. It doesn't always have to. I be. hate mayonnaise. It doesn't always have to. Yeah doesn't appeal to me. give me the burgers give me the dogs i'll eat ribs but we don't like i'm i'm gonna be grilling on memorial day so good and if you're if we're you're just doing dogs and, and burgers and i don't know probably some other form of vegetable or corn or something if you're over 12 years old and you put ketchup on your hot dog you should be banned from eating hot dogs well you know what i'm not gonna be banned and i don't care that i put ketchup on my hot dogs well you're you're, you're just you deserve to not even be called an american anymore I don't think that's how it works. That's kind of how it works. Mm-mm, negative. Yep. negative. You lost your citizenship, sir. No. Putting ketchup on a hot dog is just it's it's just so disrespectful. Put to that a hot in the dog. Constitution, then. I will put it in the Constitution. Right. I mean, it it just should be unwritten. You should just know ketchup on a hot dog is not a thing. It's a it shouldn't. Thing. It shouldn't be a thing if you're under twelve years old. Why over, is, over why 12, is 12, twelve the cutoff? Because you're before teenager. You're still so is still it, learning. Is it twelve or under, or is it under twelve? Twelve and under. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you're over, that's why I said if you're over 12. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still good putting it on. Well, I mean, you got terrible taste buds. What can I say? I have delicious taste buds. You don't. You Look, don't. You uh, don't. At the end of the day, my friend, at least we call Taylor Ham the right thing. Sure, but no. I mean, I mean, this isn't even... I kind of want to just pack up and go home. You are home. Yeah. This is, it, we record at your house. Sir. I want to go in the next room and just not even continue with this. Right, this fine. is... This is... Walk off. I'll just do the show. Do it. Go. This is the end of the Couchside Judges. We quit over ketchup on a hot dog. I think we've delayed this far too long, my friend. Sure. The, the bit has run its course. No, I'm still upset. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Well, like I, like we've said, we do not have any live fights to be talking about. We're not doing any uh, contested rounds this week. So usually on those weeks, we end up doing something you know less common, I guess, in these days that does qualify uh, for something like past judgment, which you know we did recently, we did a few weeks ago. Yeah. We did a little bit of a one we've never done before, plus an appeal edition, which would be where we revisit a fight from you know our earlier episodes, especially before we kind of had, I think, as, as a strong an understanding of how to apply the criteria as we do now. And uh, in this case, we're gonna do two appeal editions for this episode. Both of which we talked about again in those early episodes. And let's start, my friend, with a fight involving one of your favorites, BJ Penn. We did that last time. We'll do it again. BJ found himself in a lot of decisions, close decisions throughout his career. Um, Contested decisions, you could say, right? So we're going to do this one. BJ Penn against George St. Pierre, number one. Because the second fight didn't leave a lot to the imagination as far as who won also, there was the corner stoppage, so that... It was a corner helped. stop, but, I mean, GSP was full of, full of olive oil in <laughs> Greece anyway, so... <laughs> we're not going to revisit that one too deeply. Um, but, yeah, so we'll start with that one, and we're also going to revisit a fun grappling-centric fight from the past with featuring two of the greatest lighter weight fighters of all time, 
Miguel Torres, and Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson before DJ became the legend that we know today. But before we go into those, and I think we'll probably start with uh, GSP and BJ, let's go into not just uh, the the way Appeal Edition works, but how past judgment works for uh, maybe our less, you know, less familiar listener. Yeah, I, I got the spiel here. Go for it. So we score it. Using the ABC criteria based on effective striking and grappling and the three Ds, damage, dominance, and duration. 10-9 round is where neither fighter checks off a D to a strong degree. A 10-8 can be considered for one D but must be given when two Ds are achieved. And a 10-7 can be considered for two Ds but must be given for all three. The rare 10-10 is for partial rounds and basically staring contests. We've eliminated effective aggression and area control because it's extremely rare judges use these anyway. Okay. GSP, BJ Pen 1, set it up. Okay, so like I said, we went over this a long time ago, several years ago, in episode 7. I don't encourage you to go listen to it, but if you want to, it's there. Just, just you know, making sure we're not hiding from our past, right? This one happened at UFC 58 back on March 4th, 2006 at Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas. The main card bout beat, uh, well, this was on the main card, excuse me, uh, of a, f- a pay-per-view headlined by Rich Franklin against David Loazzo. Franklin defending that middleweight title back in the day. BJ, he had won the welterweight title two years earlier by stunning Matt Hughes. Left, contract dispute, went and had a bunch of fights, won them at various weights all the way up to open weight against Leota Machida. Uh, This was his first fight back in the UFC. Came in here at, uh, it was 11 and 2 and 1. So a much more sterling record than BJ happened to finish out with. George St. Pierre. 11-1 Eleven and one at the time, he'd won four straight fights after B, uh, excuse me, Matt Hughes submitted him in his first title challenge. Probably rushed into the title fight, and it was also coming off of the finishes of Sean Shirk and Frank Trigg, who is now, of course, a referee. This was also a welterweight title eliminator to face Hughes. So big stakes on this one. Judges here, Nelson Doc Hamilton, Cecil Peoples, and Marcos Rosales. The referee was Herb Dean, a very young looking Herb Dean, my my dad. And uh, we also don't have I didn't look at Herb Dean. What's that? I didn't even look at him. What do you mean? When I was I probably talked about it for like two minutes straight before the fight. I You're just ignoring me? I definitely didn't even I, I most likely just zoned out. That's all right. I don't even recall this at all. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, yeah, again, this is uh, this being an older fight, we do not have the individual round score, so they're just final tally. Did I respond to you? I don't know, man. It was a long time ago. I don't remember it at all. <laughs> Are you all right tonight? Well, no. Well, I mean, you, you have upset me, but I'll push through. <laughs> Get over the catch thing, boy. Don't call me boy. Guy. All right, bro. Let's go. Let's go. Round one. Oh, yeah, round one. <laughs> you all right, man? Yeah, Penn busting him up nice. Uh, nose is bleeding. Eye is messed up. Uh, he's proven he's the much better striker in this round. GSP's landing a couple decent shots here and there, staying competitive, but we definitely have solid damage here. I'm going 10-8. I went for the 9 here, and originally I had gone the 8. We both went for the 8 the last time we, we had scored this one, and I was torn. But ultimately, I just, you know, you can you can check off damage, I guess, in the sense that there's a lot of there's a lot of blood, right? His face is busted up, GSPs. Yeah. But I I don't know. It, it didn't seem like it was the type of damage that was diminishing him as a fighter. Oh, I mean, it definitely diminishes him. He's got a broken nose and his eye is swelling. He's definitely diminished. You yeah. can't argue he's not diminished. Well, I just did. But you can't. <laughs> you can't. It, it, you have a broken nose. You can't breathe as well. You have a busted eye. You can't see as well. You're diminished. Plain and simple. Yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. I did side with the nine. I was very torn here, though. I, I feel like this round looks a little different than other rounds do. And that's, you know, I do like to talk about like it's a different round. You know, I did just go for the nine, though. I, I feel like it's still kind of close either way. But but yeah, I, I'm I'll stick with my nine. But You're I totally right. respect your eight here. My right. friend. Um, again, we don't know what the judges originally gave. I'm pretty sure we could guess here that they had both scored this. Uh, they all scored this a 10 nine for BJ Penn, which is the right score. In the typical mm-hmm. ABC scoring format, of course. Um, but we just have a little bit more flexibility in uh, the CSJ system, right? Mm-hmm. What about round two? Uh, g- good competitive round. Both guys had good offense on the feet. But as the round went on, I thought BJ started to slow down. GSP started pulling ahead. That early takedown and ground and pound is kind of really what pushes it over uh, for GSP. 10-9, pretty clear. It's a close round. I-, I think I can understand why this might have ended up potentially being a swing round. Mm, yeah, I guess maybe. But yeah, I think I think 
definitely felt pretty good about St. Pierre here both times we watched it. Mm-hmm. Last time we had both given the 10 nines here. I don't think we feel distinctly different about this round than when the last time we talked about it. No. It's it's com- it's competitive, but I think it's still I feel good about St. Mm-hmm. Pierre here. That's that's kind of where I would say, land with that. So, so I have it at 19 apiece. You have it at 1918 for Penn. Yep. And again, we don't know exactly what the judges had, but we'll we could assume this. Could be, I don't know. It's, it's, I'll ask you after the last round, I guess, mm-hmm. which, which one you think really was the swing round, because this does go down as a split decision. That's not spoiling a whole lot there for people who know this fight. But what about round three? I thought this one was a close one. Uh, it's similar to round two on the feet, decently close. BJ seems to just be a tad behind while being held against the fence a lot. Uh, GSP had two good takedowns, one one pretty good slam. Uh, he does land some good ground and pound, which I do think is the difference. BJ attacked pretty solidly from the bottom, attacking that go-go Pilata, landing some decent punches from there. But GSP was also returning fire. I think the guy from the top is landing a bit stronger there. I got to go 10-9 G- GSP. I can't help but get excited every time I see the go-go plot mm-hmm. position come into play. I, I know this fight. I've seen it many times. I also know we're talking about a decision, and I'm still sitting there like, ooh, go-go plot him, maybe? I think, he, <laughs> I think he had it if he just swung his leg over, but he didn't. It's a hard one to finish, obviously. That's why we don't see it. But, man, I just want it. I just want it one day. Maybe maybe, maybe I'll make history change if I want it bad enough. I think so. we'll make, we might see one this weekend. You think so? Yeah. From who? Jim Miller. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll see. Uh, but yeah, so I, I had the same score as you here. 10-9 GSP. Competitive round. Do you think this is a swing round? Which one do you think is the, the swing? I mean, I, I think... If there is only one swing round. If there's... Uh, yeah. I we guess. don't know. I want to say maybe two, but also three BJ has some stronger offense than he did in round two. Yeah, that's the tricky so, thing, right? I don't... I don't they, they both could be a swing. Who knows? It's Yeah, it's true. This is a close fight. This is a competitive fight, and obviously... Of all of the rounds, you know, even though I had nines here, the only round that I thought about going farther than a nine was round one for BJ. So it's definitely one of those fights that I feel like, even though I went for the nine here, at least having the option for the tool to be able to be taken just like you did, you took advantage of. I think it's nice to have that here. So, but I, but nonetheless, I still have a natural 29 28 for St. Pierre. You ended up at a draw at 28 apiece, which is what we had last time. Again, your score didn't change, and, and you had the same score I had last time, but my my round one basically was the only thing that changed. So, um, I don't know. I, I, what do you think? I mean, do you think we needed the, the, this type of scoring for this type of fight? You obviously you obviously went that way in round one, so. Well, I feel that's how the fight was. I mean, to, does it draw. Co- do you come away with a feeling like a draw is, the, is a better result? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I'd rather a winner, but because draws are stupid. Well, draws are stupid, but um, also... You know, and every single every single fight should have a draw clause where you go to a fourth round if it's a draw. The uh, every sudden victory. Every single fight should be sudden victory. Okay, get rid of these draws. I would be okay with that. Yeah, I don't know that you can get commissions to sign off on something like that, but they know. should. You know, first things first, they got to get our our system in play, right? Yeah, but any any <laughs> I mean any draw you get, I mean that be that be great actually. What having sudden victory in every single fight. I mean, it doesn't come therefore, into play that often. But because therefore, now refs may be more willing to take a point because they know, hey, the guy, if it goes to a draw, he'll have an opportunity and sudden victory. Mm-hmm. So that 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 point doesn't isn't in the back of the refs. My head, I don't want I don't want to involve myself too much in this fight. It'll, ima- it'll help, I think. Can that, you imagine if they have to sense. take a point again in, in the, the well? Sudden that victory I mean, that's on the fighter one. though. That's on the fighter. <laughs> it's just got to keep going. That's it. <laughs> I don't. I don't think you get commissions, unfortunately, to sign off on that. But I, I you, mean, I like the idea. I'm not saying I'm against it. You lose a point in sudden victory, you you lose. I wouldn't hate that. But then you're not going to see officials take the point because they don't want to be the one to decide it either. Hey, if the fighter does it, then it's on them. Sure, sure. But again, we're talking about something that we see happening. You're talking about maybe the willingness to take more points. We're also talking about a scenario where they're going to take less points. If it's the same mentality, you know. I I understand what you're saying, sure. but. At that point, you're already in sudden victory. Get yourself involved, ref. Fair enough, fair enough. But, uh, yeah, so like I said, last time we all had 28 apiece. You stuck with that. I have 29-28 St. Pierre. The judges, two of which had St. Pierre by the same score I did, Nelson Hamilton and Marcos Rosales. It was Cecil Peoples, who was the out judge, saw this one for Penn, 29-28. Typically the villain. But in your, in your book, he's the hero. Because but he, he was the Penn. hero. You do love your BJ Penn, don't you? Um, I feel like we could do like so many more BJ. We've done a bunch already. Mm-hmm. You know what? You, I I just remember you you. I remember you asking me if 
if you thought if I thought uh, Eddie Bravo read the three and a half pages. Yes, because the back in the to to set it up back in the day, for those who don't remember, Eddie Bravo used to do kind of like the hey, what'd you how'd you score that round, Eddie? Mm-hmm. And, yeah, so I, yes, like you said, I did ask you if I thought if we thought he read the uh, the three and a half pages. So I'm I'm just remembering a video I saw years ago at Eddie Bravo's Tenth Planet uh, in California. Mm-hmm. Cecil Peoples was there training, so I'm gonna say yeah, he probably does. But do you think Cecil Peoples has oh. the last iteration <laughs> right. of the criteria? He doesn't. Right. He doesn't judge anymore, so mm. there's not necessarily. I know, but this, this. I mean, but I'm saying this video is like ten years old. Mm. Oh, sure, like, maybe even older. Yeah, I'm, t- I'm talking so. about the current iteration. I'm not talking oh. about back then. Oh, oh, I mean, back then I would have my doubts anyway. Touche. But that was. I mean, anything else to say about this particular fight before we move on? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, BJ would would have beat Hughes after. <laughs> For the belt, I don't. Do you remember at all? Uh, you know your mentality the last time you were because we didn't go back and re-listen to that episode that we originally talked about this. But do you remember your mentality like when you saw this fight the first time we scored it? My mentality as far as what the scoring, you know, I think I was fine with it. Nothing changed. Yeah. Okay. I mean, twenty nine, twenty eight, Saint Pierre makes a lot of sense. Well, uh, no, no, no. So, I'm, I'm talking. I'm talking about the twenty eight, twenty eight that we originally scored back in in episode seven. Uh, I might. I mean, I I may have felt strongly that we need you know more uh varied scores sure available but less so now more of more of just you know we've, we've beaten a dead horse <laughs> about it so kind of numb to it fair enough but uh yeah so we can move on to the other fight that we have here miguel torres against dimitri's Mighty mouse johnson which we first talked about on this show on episode 18 uh, so still that first year that we were doing this about three years ago UFC 130 was when this fight actually happened. It was the featured prelim on Spike TV. Back when the prelims used to be there at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas on May 28th, 2011. And in the previous fight, George St. Pierre had GetSpike.com on his trunks. Interesting. Yeah. So he was ad- I guess you had to order Spike TV if he didn't just normally come with your cable package. I guess so. By the way, May 28th is almost exactly 12 years ago. As of... It's currently yeah. May 28th right That's now. That's right. Well, as we record it, but you know, yeah. people are listening to this on Memorial Day. But it, nonetheless, they, they used to have, that used to be a big weekend for the UFC. They would do Memorial Day weekend fights, and now they take that off. I kind of like yeah. it. Um, I mean, I don't know if I like it, but there's other weekends that used to be real big that aren't as big anymore. Super Bowl weekend used to be huge, and now it's, they don't really. They only did that on. for a few years, though. It was like, it, but was it was just like good, a period of time. It was a good few years. I did like it, yeah. Well, I think what happened was they had they had a big show planned in like, it was twenty. I want to say it was 2016 they were planning to do a big one, and then it kind of fell apart, so they turned it into like a fight night Mm. right before the Super Bowl. And it was almost like after that, they were like, well, we're not going to bother anymore. I mean, because they're going to do a Super Bowl in Vegas. We know that's coming. Yeah. They'll probably do something big then. Super Super Bowl fight week on Saturday. All the the players are at the fights. They did that here uh, in in New York. Mm. Well, New York and New Jersey. I mean, everything happened in New Jersey. Let's, let's face it. Yeah, we kind of get shafted. We do. We're used I, to it. It's Jersey. There's, there's a, it's always there's a prime time Sunday night giant game, and they always show like a, a like a helicopter view of this New York City. It's like we're not in New York City. No. Show Route Three. Just show pictures of the swamp. Show Route Three. Yeah, that'd be good. All the cars on Route Three. Yeah. <laughs> All the traffic. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, the headliner for this one uh, was Rampage Jackson. Pay-per-view headliner against uh, Matt Hamill, which when you look back at it, it's like, well, Miguel Torres against Demetrius Johnson, like that, just the, if you know the names, like, well, that would be the one, right? Because that's a major fight. Not Rampage, who of course was a big name against Matt Hamill, who le- less of a big name, you know, in, in, in the grand scheme. But nonetheless, it was, that was what they were able to do pay-per-views for back <laughs> at that time. <laughs> Rampage in an untitled fight. Um it's, but as as I noted here, and I mentioned the last time we talked about this episode, this bought this got three hundred twenty five thousand buys. This pay per view, impressive back then, a lot. Uh, Torres at the time that was on the cusp. You know of, what? Because they weren't as that? often. Fights weren't as often. No, well, they had pay per views so, as often, but they didn't have as many. You know, non pay per view fights. Yeah. The schedule was more like, you know, twenty to twenty five a year. Mm-hmm. And that was a they created more demand. I liked that. I missed it. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Yeah, your guy Brian Stan was on the card. I love Brian Stan. He's the man. But yeah, so Torres was on the cusp of getting his uh his UFC bantamweight title fight, which he never actually did. 
So, spoiler alert, he lost his fight. Um, I think everybody knows by now. Uh, he was, of course, the longtime 135-pound king at many places, including during his WEC run. Uh, he had lost two in a row coming to this one, one to Brian Bowles when he dropped the belt, and then the next one to Joseph Benavidez. Now, at this point, uh, he had actually is coming in on a little bit of a hot streak, one, two in a row, including his UFC debut after the UFC finally absorbed WEC. Mighty Mouse, on the other hand, had won three straight after dropping his WEC debut in, for his first career defeat. He won his UFC debut against the late kid Yamamoto. Um... And, uh, and yeah, so let's look at the judges here. We have Dave Hagen, Glenn Trowbridge, and Tony Weeks with the referee, Josh Rosenthal. So is he still in jail? No, he's not in jail anymore. Oh. It's been a while. I probably asked that at the same time. You probably did. I probably did. You probably did. <laughs> but, yeah, so he, he's, he has paid his debt to society. Okay. Uh, let's go into round one here. Fun grappling round. Mighty Mouse lands a couple leg kicks before getting a takedown. Uh, Torres sweeps him. Torres landing some decent ground and pound. Johnson's throwing elbows. I, I kind of think they're landing to the trap or the shoulder. They don't look uh, anything really great coming from the bottom. Uh, Mighty Mouse eventually gets back on top. Uh, Torres attacks a knee bar. And then they get stuck in that 50-50 position. Uh, both swinging punches at each other. No, I don't think anyone landed. Um, and then Not a lot of punches this whole fight land. Yeah, they, they scramble a bit. And Torres ends the round with a decent guillotine attack. Uh, 10-9 Torres. Yeah, I think this is a harder round to give to Mighty Mouse Johnson in any way. Um, but fortunately, none of the judges did at that time either. Uh, this was all Torres. 10-9 from me. 10-9 from you. We had both had 10-9 last time too. So yeah, I think everything kind of just held serve, right? Mm -hmm. About round two. Yeah, round two. Wild round. Very close. Uh, DJ kind of blitzes to start the round forward for a brief time. It's on the feet. Uh, but DJ takes him down, Torres attacks subs, uh, especially that triangle he uses to sweep, uh, but they scramble. I think this whole round, DJ's kind of defensive mostly, uh, Tor even though he's on top, Torres landing some good elbows off his back. Seems all of DJ's offense on top is kind of just stay busy offense, throwing these punches with real no, no real intent behind them, is how I feel they are. Not very effective offense. Yeah. Uh, Torres keeps attacking and making him defend, and... I think that's why he wins the round 10-9. Yeah, I absolutely do, too. I think this is this is a good example of, of effective grappling from the bottom, mm -hmm. uh, especially. I was I was I thought he I thought he had a good round here, a nice solid round. Definitely not approaching that eight that we would be potentially giving out. No. It, this is yeah, I think it's harder to get in a grappling round without getting some sort of, you know, good submission attack in there. And we didn't quite have that. We had, you know, effort. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, he's trying to get those positions, but there's nothing that's actually really threatening. Uh, to finish the fight, you know, so I, I felt good with the nine here. I think you did too in the same way. So yeah, we both got 20 to 18 in favor of Torres, which is what we had last time as well. Uh, but all the judges on this one, because again, this this fight, we actually do have the judges scorecards for everyone had Mighty Mouse 10 nine on this one, which tied it up at 19 apiece. And it was interesting. I don't remember if it was this round or if it was the final round. It was both. It, it was both round. Yeah. You know what I'm going to say? Yeah. Jo where with uh, Joe Rogan, yeah. where he makes the comment of, you know, he, even though he's, you know, going for submission attempts, having a or having, going for all these grappling things, uh, I forget exactly. Joe does say, hey, you know, he's on top. You know, you know, the judges feel about that more or less. And and nowadays, I think a lot more. There's a lot more evolution in judges and how they understand grappling. But mm -hmm. I think at the time, Joe was probably he's, right he's because probably yeah, right he does then. won this round. He does win this round. Yeah. You know, and and it doesn't seem like. It doesn't seem like Mighty Mouse is controlling the action of this round. You know what I mean? No. He's, he's more of a, a, a passenger on the ride that... He's reacting. Yes. He's all reacting absolutely. the whole way. Yeah, absolutely. Good, I mean, good competitive round, but still feel like the right. Right, rightful winner is Torres here. Mm -hmm. uh, what about round three? Uh, another good grappling battle. Again, Mighty Mouse is on top. Uh, he's stuck in that reverse triangle, almost coming around to the back, figure four type position that... Uh, Mighty uh, Torres has him in, and Torres is landing some elbows from here. I thought these are pretty solid strikes. Uh, Torres gets a nice hip bump sweep to mount. It was it was actually really tremendous. It really was. Um, but he doesn't really do much from here. He just kind of hangs out and mount for like a minute uh, while Mighty Mouse scrambles to get back to his butterfly guard. It scores uh, enough, though. I mean, it's, it's effective he, grappling. In yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. To a yeah. dominant position. He was. I mean, he smothered him for a minute, or not? Probably wasn't even a minute. No, it was less. Than uh. Torres attacks, you know, a strong guillotine attack that, that Mighty Mouse does escape. 
I think it's pretty clear for Torres in this round. 10-9. I feel like this is a competitive round. I do. It's competitive, but I think it's quite leaning the one way to Torres. I don't disagree. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. I guess just, just to clarify my thoughts on it, I just did think it was it was pretty competitive, but in the sense that Yes, I think I feel good about Torres. I mean, here the there's there's too. there's a point here where Mighty Mass is getting around to like the turtle positions, but he's not doing anything there. He's like Torres keeps scrambling, rolling, keeping Mighty Mouse off balance and attacking. Well, Mighty Mouse is really just kind of like you said on along for the ride. Yeah, that's what it feels like. It does. It does. It really does. Um, who would you rather be in this round? You know, that's not that's not the metric that you're supposed to be using. Just you know, let's let's say for devil's advocate's sake here I would, I would rather be torres i think you'd rather be torres absolutely so yeah i i have i have torres 10 9 which gives me 30 27 on my card same as you you had this score last time last time i actually gave round three to mighty mouse johnson i couldn't tell you why mm. you want to go back and listen to why i'm sure i said some bs at the time that made some sense to me then <laughs> now uh, less so so but but yeah so i my final score at the time was still 29 28 in favor of torres but yeah so i'm, I'm united with you in the 30 27 camp for Torres, but this was another round that all three judges gave to Mighty Mouse. Back this at the one, time. this one, even even with the back then, I mean, I, it's kind of head scratching a little bit. I'm yeah. curious. I'm curious how we got to this point, but nonetheless, what we did is we had a unanimous 29-28 again with all, all. This is a fight that we wouldn't even necessarily be talking about today in, in terms of contested rounds because all the judges had the same scores. We might talk about it anyway. Yeah, we might. This would, probably would have probably, probably still would have made it. Probably would have. But I, yeah, I, I have. Here's a question for you. Is this a robbery? I mean, I don't want to call it a robbery because the way things were scored back Sky, then. Things were scored back then. Let's yeah. put it this way. If three judges came back with these scores and these rounds today, is this a robbery? Um, little, Again, more devil's advocate here. I would think I would be upset that they were all unanimous for Mighty Mouse in round three. Mm-hmm. I, would, that would, I would just be upset about round three saying this, this is not the right score. But that would mean... The wrong guy wins. Which, so that's, I mean, that's my definition of a robbery. If the wrong guy wins, one where you can't make the argument for the rounds, enough rounds, that's, that's what qualifies as a robbery in my book. So yeah, I I think I probably would, but maybe I'm too extreme here. I don't know. I mean, let us know what you guys think. Very competitive. I mean, yeah. And and again, we're talking about a fight that happened 12 years ago under different scoring systems. So we're not really criticizing the judges of the time, more the idea of what it would be today i feel like i i would love to know what other people I think it would be scored better today though today. i think so too you know no, nothing against the three judges here um but i think we have some more judges in the pool that work particularly las vegas which is where this happened who have better experience with grappling and more are more savvy mm-hmm. with grappling than you know no offense to tony weeks who i think still is a solid judge he's still kind of more of a boxing background guy you know Mm -hmm. it's just the way it is um you know dave hagan obviously is knows the mma game pretty well he's been in the game a while now he's actually a regulator stepped over and is now uh in charge of the oregon commission all right every fight in oregon goes sudden victory dave (laughs) start it up um but but yeah so ultimately my card changed a little bit as it did in the last fight you you stay consistent each time I don't know if you just had a better understanding or if you just more stubborn. I don't know. I don't know. A little of both. Or neither. Yeah. Maybe it's magic. Smoke and mirrors. It's magic. <laughs> but yeah, that that is uh that is it for our double dose of past judgment appeal edition. Let's move on to again looking ahead to this weekend here. UFC Vegas number seventy four. Oh boy. Saturday, nine PM Eastern time, main card start. Of course the prelims will start earlier. Not that this is necessarily the most attractive uh, of fight cards top to bottom, I would say, but I feel like those are the best ones to put after a week where there is no UFC because then people will take whatever they can, like fiends. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I feel like VOC has to realize at this point, like if we have a trash card, not that this is a trash card necessarily, because there's two fights here that I think we both really like mm-hmm. and we'll talk about them in a moment, but you could put anything on the next week and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah this is great. I'll take whatever. Throw a bunch of heavyweights on here. That's fine. Oh, yeah. Give me all the heavyweights. <laughs> Got some of that heavyweight you got over there. <laughs> uh, but the, the, I mean, at least the headliner. I'm very happy that we have this. The first non-title men's flyweight main event that we've had in the UFC in almost six years. 
it's about time. It should have been a few weeks ago when it was Brandon Royval against. Uh, oh goodness, I'm forgetting everything now. Who did he just beat? Royval. Yeah, who did he just beat? I talked to him about this fight, and I can't even remember. I'm blanking. Yeah, I don't remember when. What people... <laughs> wow, we're terrible. That far. <laughs> we've been we've been out of the fight game for so long. It's been almost a week since we watched live fights. And we forgot everything that ever happened. Yeah, I just don't. Uh, he beat Mateus Nikolaou. Oh yes, Mateus Nikolaou. That's right. It was it was an amazing performance. It's like who's who's the guy he beat? Of course, uh, that should have been in this position where it was the main event. Instead, Kai Kara France against Amir Al Bazi. I like it, but eh, just just feels like it should should have uh, been the other fight. That was of more mm-hmm. import here. But I like this fight. I'm looking forward to it. Do you like it? Oh yeah, this should this should be a banger of a of a flyweight fight, I think. And hopefully, it will kickstart the idea that we can put more of these flyweight fights in these prominent positions because Listen, they're more interesting. You give them five rounds with other organizations stepping into the flyweight pool. That's right, Bellator. Just the other time day. to time to showcase your flyweights. I would think and so. promote them a little better. Should have done that, you know. 12 years ago when Mighty Mouse was running mm-hmm. over the place. That was that was the thing that always bothered me about Mighty Mouse and the way they promoted him. And, you know, I think there were efforts made by the UFC to try and promote him. I think they did some things. I don't, I don't think they completely ignored. I think there's things they could have done better. But one thing in particular that I thought they should have done better to beef up that division is maybe when they're trying to come up with the next title contender, don't put the number one contender fight on, like, the Facebook prelims or whatever the heck they used to do. Feature it somewhere. Let people yeah. know who, he, who he's going to be fighting instead of just, oh, it's like he's fighting X-Body next. You still have people that the lower the weight class, the less interested they are. Well, they're dumb. And it's, it, they don't they understand. are very dumb. They don't understand how, how not only fun they are, but just skilled and talented and entertaining. They're, I mean, they're still, people still out there think heavyweight is the premier division. And it's, it, that's far from the truth. Oh, goodness. That bothers me. On a lot of levels. Yeah. There's a couple of heavyweight fights on this card. We don't need to mention them, though, do we? Somewhat mention it. Arlovsky's just trying to keep pace with Jim. Andre Arlovsky, yes. Yeah, that's all he's trying to do. He's trying to keep pace with Jim Miller, who is yeah. on this card. Right. That's why he has to be on it. Yes. Because Jim Miller Jim Miller was supposed to be on this card anyway, but his original opponent, yeah. whose name escapes me. Ludovic Klein. That's right. Ludovic Klein. That, I you. actually like that matchup for Jim a lot. Okay. But but uh, now we have Jared Gordon stepping in a tough, tough uh, uh Last minute change here for Jim Miller and Jared Gordon. What do you think of this fight? I think Jim cruises to victory. Well, of course you do. I mean, um, you're, you're going to think yeah, that no matter what. But uh, tougher opponent, I think for sure. Hey, listen. How do you how do you Klein. think Jim Miller does against the Son of God? Like Jesus, Jesus Christ comes in here. What do you got? Well, I don't. I mean, Jesus was a little thin, right? He was. So he probably wouldn't. More of a pacifist too, to be fair. Yeah, he's not a fighter. <laughs> he's not not a fighter. But uh, but if you remember the old uh, clothing label, Jesus didn't tap. I do remember, remember yeah, that. Jesus, Jesus didn't tap. <laughs> Jesus didn't tap. I mean, well, then you just kind of hope the ref has some mercy there and you know stops it. That's true. Um, I don't know. He's got superpowers, so <laughs> he's got superpowers. Could, yes, indeed. Uh, but I to go back to the actual fight here, of course, Miller against Gordon. I do like this fight. I think it's an entertaining fight. I like I like Jim Miller fighting veterans more than I like him fighting. Now, and Ludovic Klein was a, was a solid matchup here but he he gets matched up too many times jim miller against like prospects feel like or... they try to make a name you know <sighs> like if they can it, there's it, it's like okay well give jim a, a prospect because you know if jim gets a win that that's great for everybody and if the other but guy wins beat everybody on the planet and if the other guy wins they can say hey we got uh oh this guy got a win over jim miller i mean we can market that sure so i think that was kind of what they're thinking was but this it's more fun like you said with with vets He's got basically For one us, more year. Anyway. He's got almost one more year at this point. I think it looks like they're trying to get him on track to get what he wants, which is to fight at UFC 300 next summer. If somehow he gets snubbed on that, I might quit watching MMA. <laughs> really? A big. This is this. Gonna is, quit the show? I mean, unless it's something that happens like injury wise or something that he and he, and he can't fight. Mm-hmm. I would. I would just be so disappointed. In I. Him. I would be absolutely stunned if the UFC didn't attempt to put him on. UFC 300. Like, I, I imagine they will. I think they know the value in trying to do something there. So I don't think you have to worry. I think it would probably take something more like, like you said, where honestly, a fortunate circumstance where he is hurt. Honestly, that fight shouldn't even have a way in. <laughs> there shouldn't even be a way in for that fight on UFC 300. Maybe he'll take a, maybe what he'll do is uh, he could fight at one. He's always wanted to fight again at 170 pounds. I think he had the one recently, but I think probably he wouldn't mind taking a no weight cut in the last fight. Yeah, I'm sure. Just, just fight yeah. anyone who normally fights at lightweight and just be like, yo, how about we just fight at 170 anyway? 
last fight. Who would you want his last opponent to be? Be realistic, though. Okay. Be se- seriously, I'm, uh, I'm asking you a serious question. Who's the last guy out there that he hasn't fought that you'd like, or or a rematch if you feel like it in his last fight? Honestly, you know who doesn't want that fight because mm. it would it would be so such a tough, risky fight for him. Islam. Islam. <laughs> he wouldn't. Up. He wouldn't. He that would be such a risky fight because my last fight, I'm going out. I'm going. I got a chance at the belt. I'm gonna rip your head off. I'm a dog. I'm going for it. Chop out your legs. It's over. Please give me another name. <laughs> serious who is he even who do you want him to fight that he would actually fight there fine <laughs> all right if i'm matchmaking jim miller and you want you want one more his you final want a dream fight, fight that you haven't had yet or that you want a rematch of yeah that, okay. that actually could happen that actually like could that happen. like that the matchmakers would sit there and be like you know what that's not a bad idea dan i think we could make that happen someone that's just gonna go go toe to toe with him mm-hmm. oh man probably not a third joe lozon fight no, nah, I think, yeah, I think, I mean, Dan Hooker would probably be, they already fought, right? Dan, yes, they Dan, did. Dan, Dan won. Dan did win. Somehow. <laughs> yeah, smoke uh, and mirrors. Someone like that. I, Hanato Moicano, actually, I think might, might be crazy fight. You like that one? Hanato versus Jim, two guys on my roster. Obviously, I'd be rooting for Jim in that sense, <laughs> but. You do have the hierarchy. I think, maybe even Matt Frivola, Jim versus Matt. That'd be a fun fight. Any anything that's just gonna be that Jim's gonna be excited to fight doesn't care win or lose. I don't think he cares who he, he fights. Doesn't period. Care. Yeah, he, 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 he doesn't. He's told us before, like he doesn't care if it's a prospect or it's a new right. Guy but I but a, I think for his yeah. final fight, he's not gonna want a guy that's gonna go in there and try to game plan him. Someone that's just gonna slug it out, try to finish him, whether it be on the ground or on the feet. Not someone that's just gonna try to out an action him. fighter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I'll give you a name. I'll give you who I would want. Go ahead. Tony Ferguson. Yeah, I mean, but come on, that's actually realistic. That's, that's fine. That's, I, I that's just, a good one. I just think Jim stomps him. Uh, <laughs> Don't isn't that what you want? I do want. Actually, so, I do want. Yeah, didn't I just sell I'm you? With you? Let's there go you for go. it. All right, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that does it for this Memorial Day episode of Appeal Edition: Past Judgment of the Couchside Judges. Hope you liked it. We will. Uh, I don't know. It'll be probably a month or two before we get to do another one. So don't worry about it. Got these fights. We'll be checking them out. Thanks for listening. Take care, everybody. Have a great week.